again, everybody. It's time for the Silver Bullets podcast. Once again, I am Michael Citro. And I'm Chip Minnick. Chip, uh, are you are you ready to talk about Mr. Owen? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Of course, Owen 5 being Mr. Owen. Uh, yes, this was the week that we played the game, or you and I didn't play it. We watched it. Uh, other guys played it. And uh, it was, uh, you know... I want to get this out there right away because last week, I think in real time, I talked myself into predicting a Michigan victory in this game. And although I, I was careful to hedge that and saying I could see Ohio State winning by four or five touchdowns, and uh, clearly my uh, post traumatic stress disorder uh, from the John Cooper years got the better of me as I picked a Michigan win. I was the only one, I think, in our staff picks. And that did not happen. Ohio State held serve in the series and uh, continues to dominate the series actually and uh, went into Ann Arbor bombed Ann Arbor uh, and uh, the evidence of that is the giant hole in the ground in Ann Arbor where the game was played actually and uh, the Buckeyes win 56-27 so I'm curious did you get a lot of colorful comments about your prediction from from uh, Ohio State fans not as many as you'd think uh, just a couple and one of them was like before the game even started. Uh, somebody was uh, saying I was whack for uh, for thinking Michigan would win the game, and and I wanted to just make sure that people knew I I didn't say Michigan would win the game. My prediction was that they would win the game because my predictions are always gut predictions. It's like what do I feel like will happen? Mm-hmm. And you can talk about stats till the cows come home, but in this series we've seen that a, a lot of times stats and and trends don't mean a lot and so i know that it's easy for the younger generation who have seen only what one loss in the last what 15 16 years uh might find it hard to believe that someone would uh predict a a you know a win for michigan in the series but folks of of your age and my age can understand why i might pick that Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's when you went through a period of two ten and one under John Cooper. That's why I certainly understood your apprehension about the game. I obviously I thought Ohio State would win, but I never expected them to blow the doors off the Wolverines the way that they did. Right. And, and the thing too was, you know, for for what we've seen and all the good things that we've seen Ohio State do this year, the biggest game that the team had played to date. The coaching staff kind of played it very safe, and and I don't think that that same approach would have worked against Michigan. No, and I, that's kind of when we when we were reviewing the Penn State win, I kind of suspected that Coach Day was being deliberately conservative to to hold back that the game was won. He didn't want to showcase anything uh, that he might want to use against the Wolverines. So it wasn't entirely surprising. Like I said a moment ago, the thing that was most surprising was the final score. I never anticipated Ohio State being so dominant in every phase of the game. You predicted a 10-point victory, 31-21, to 21, uh, but by virtue of me picking Ohio State uh, or predicting an Ohio State loss, you won the predictions this week. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. You have to admit. Uh, you have to admit that at the half, when it seemed as though it was kind of going back and forth. I should, I can't. I, let me rephrase that. It wasn't even at the half because Ohio State had a pretty substantial lead going into the half. And I know we'll review the game here in a moment. That it seemed like okay, this is going to kind of go back and forth, back and forth, and then all of a sudden, in the latter part of the second quarter, Ohio State pulled away. Uh, the only time Ohio State trailed was on the opening series Mm -hmm. i mean they never ever they never ever yes it was by one point uh that they had a lead for a a period of time but ohio state was in complete control pretty much from almost the from the end of the second quarter through through the duration of the game yeah it was an interesting game in in a lot of ways and and you know part of my apprehension didn't even have anything to do with the loss of of Sean Wade because at the time we recorded last week we didn't know Sean Wade would be out so that kind of added to my angst a little bit as well on game day I'm gonna say you know I I I don't sleep well the night before a Michigan game I uh I tend to get up very early 
Uh, and I'm not, you know, by nature an early riser on the weekend. Uh, if I don't have something going on, I know that you get up early and, you know, you got stuff going on with your kids and that kind of thing. I mean, I'm I'm fine letting my kid sit and watch TV while I sleep in because I, I like my sleep. But um, I didn't sleep well. I got up early. I was apprehensive, uh, very nervous for, before the game and a lot of nervous energy. And, um, you know, the, the, the way it – I wasn't too worried about the, the opening drive because – we see time and time again a, a team will come out and have a nice scripted drive that, of things that they want to get done, and they look, uh, you know, these are pr- plays that they practice. They've they've run them in, in in drills over and over. They know what they're doing. They know where they're going. It's almost very machine like. But once that once they do that, and the other team has time to adjust, you know, sometimes that the, these can be extreme blowouts. Right. I, like you said, the, the, the first drive, that was uh, kind of, you know, it was it was good to see that Ohio State, uh, even though the Wolverines came out and, and took the, the early lead, Ohio State responded immediately, drove right down the field, scored a touchdown. As I said a moment ago, they never looked back after that point. And uh, I agree 100% with what you said that when we recorded the podcast a week ago at the time, we had no idea that Sean Wade was not going to be a participant. Uh, That certainly would have impacted my predictions much more so than uh, a 31-21. I'm sure it probably would have been even closer in my my estimation. Mm -hmm. And and I think the reason for that is that one of the things that Michigan does really well – is one of the things that Sean Wade is good at stopping. And if he's not going to be in there to stop it, um, you know, you, you would expect Michigan to have some success. And indeed they did. It took it took the Buckeyes a few drives. Um, I mean, it really took them until halftime to really get everything ironed out and get people all on the same page. But I think a lot of what uh, happened in the first half was Shea Patterson getting the ball out quickly and, um, Ohio State not getting a lot of pressure on the quarterback for various reasons. Um, Partly Michigan doing a good job on double teams and uh, running uh, away from certain players, but also getting away with a little bit of, uh, uh, let's just call it, you know, questionable tactics and move on. (laughs) Um, But credit to them. They came out and they, they got Ohio State confused a few times. They got down the field. They got aided on the first drive. Uh, by what I thought was a pretty ticky tack, uh, late hit out of bounds as the Michigan player had just stepped on the sideline when he got bumped and not terribly uh, roughly bumped, uh, and that was a 15 free yards there. And then they score basically on kind of a, a jet sweep or, or end around kind of motion with Giles Jackson and uh, take a six nothing lead because uh, Quinn Nordine missed the extra point. And. I remember as soon as that happened, I thought that was going to be something that was going to loom large throughout the game. As it turns out, it wasn't as large as I anticipated, but th- those are the kind of things in a game of this magnitude that they usually do. I kind of had a vision going through my head of a, you know, a few years back, the intercepted uh, two point conversion. I, I thought, oh man, if this thing comes down to another two point conversion because of that missed extra point. Um, Things, things are going to get really, really uh, tense. Uh, the Buckeyes answered, uh, no problem. J.K. Dobbins, right from the get-go, was amazing in this game. Um, he, uh, he, <laughs> he had a little bit of a trouble hanging on the ball in the first one, but luckily uh, all of the bad bounces that Ohio State had against Penn State went the right way at Michigan as the ball bounced right up and uh, he caught it in stride and uh, took off for a 30 plus yard run on the first play of the game and that was just that was just getting started for J.K. Dobbins he finished the drive with a five yard run and the extra point made it 7-6 Buckeyes yeah like you said it was very fortuitous that that first carry I mean what are the odds that the very first carry for, for J.K. Dobbins is going to be a fumble that I think even the announcer said it was almost like he was dribbling a basketball like it went right back to him and and you know he had a you know, a strong uh, first series, which kind of was foreshadowing of how dominant of a, of a performance he was going to have for the rest of the game. Yeah, I think he was just showing off. I maybe he may have, maybe <laughs> he was uh, maybe he was risking a taunting call there. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the Buckeyes then get a stop, and the Buckeyes uh, take a 14-6 lead on a 57-yard pass from Justin Fields to Chris Olave. Let's all go to the Olave Garden for some dinner, some breadsticks, all you can eat, uh, soup and salad. And uh, it was 14-6, and we saw something against Michigan we did not see against Penn State, which was the vertical passing game. Again, I think it was we were fortunate in the sense that the weather forecast had been throughout most of last week had been forecast as being, uh, you know, not necessarily conducive to a a passing game. And, uh, you know, against Penn state, I think that that they kind of ran into that. They had the complete opposite up in Ann Arbor. Yeah, that was a, um, you know, it was Justin Fields didn't do real good out of the, out of the box. And, you know, we talked about it last week at first time quarterbacks in the game don't tend to perform well. And I think it, you know, to me, it, it looked like butterflies settle the kid down. You know, later in the game, he'll be okay if he just finds his rhythm. Sometimes players, you know, sometimes quarterbacks in this series in their first start don't ever find that rhythm. But I, I felt kind of confident that he would at some point. And I had somebody kind of getting up in my mentions about he looks bad like he did last week. And I thought, did you read the stats from last week's game at Penn, against Penn State? Because I think he only had six incomplete passes, no interceptions. So yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking he didn't have a bad game against Penn State. He was handcuffed by the play calling, uh, you know, a lot of short passes and a little bit by the weather and a little bit by the fact that, uh, you know, you, you could talk about the fumbles and maybe that was uh, – you know something you could point to, but uh, I didn't expect a return to that, and indeed we didn't have a return to that. But uh, after the Buckeyes scored, Michigan only needed three plays to go 75 yards, and uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones uh, scored from 25 yards out from Shea Patterson. And Chip, this was a play where Ohio State had some confusion in the secondary, and again, you know, not having Sean Wade in there and having some different people kind of going in and out, and um, not having worked together as a unit, uh, there was some. You would expect to have some confusion at some point, and, and unfortunately, it was here. And a great assist on this play by the right tackle, who uh, put a really nice, warm, you know, Disney-esque Olaf frozen hug on uh, Chase Young to uh, allow Patterson to get that pass away. <laughs> yeah, we were kind of wondering, uh, you know, if the officials were necessarily truly observing everything that that the television cameras were catching but like you said uh i I like the way you said it It was kind of almost like a disney-esque type uh embrace if you will (laughs) nice you know he just he loves warm hugs he's Mm -hmm. just like he's just like olaf you know who among us i've said this before who among us doesn't want to give chase young a hug right there you go i think we all do so 14 13 at the end of the first quarter, and you're, th- you're, you know, it's, it's like it's the game, man, and and Michigan's moving the ball better than we expected, and you know this is going to be an all day thing, but it was not an all day thing. The Buckeyes uh, took a bit of control in the second quarter. A pair of J.K. Dobbins touchdown runs, uh, six yards and five yards, and uh, the Buckeyes end up taking a 28 to 13 lead at that point, aided. Uh, in large part due uh, a, a, an offside penalty uh, on Michigan on a fourth and four when the Buckeyes were about to punt. And that kept the drive alive, and the Buckeyes made the Wolverines uh, pay for that mistake. I'll say this much. When those kind of mental errors, like you like you just said about the, the offsides and, and Ohio State immediately capitalized upon it, those are the kind of things that you and I remember about the, the the dreadful two ten and one era, you know, that it just seems as though like all of the costly mistakes, the mental errors that that just kind of that was kind of where the uh, the bad momentum started mm-hmm. for Ohio State back in those days, and it seemed to me that that was kind of how it actually wound up, you know, affecting that, you know, as as evidenced by the fact that Ohio State scored a touchdown uh, on the very next play after. Uh, the Wolverines, you know, that you, you, they're, they're probably thinking, okay, we've, you know, we've got them, you know, force them into a punting situation. And the next thing you know, okay, no offsides, 
uh, you know, and then you know, fresh life, and of course, Ohio State capitalized upon that. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> Uh, I believe that was a leader on the defense, uh, Kalik Hudson, that jumped offside. Absolutely, it was. So yes, it kept the uh, kept the drive alive. Ohio State was able to capitalize on that. The Wolverines were able to drive down the field uh, deep into Ohio State territory late in the half, and were stopped. And on uh, fourth down and goal, uh, Jim Harbaugh chip uh, with the interesting call to take the three points going into the locker room knowing that Ohio State was getting the ball. Very perplexing. And considering the the field position, you would have figured other people would have really had challenged him about, you know, coach, you know, we're, we're you know, deep in, a, you know, we're, we're deep within scoring p- position. I mean, like, let's go for it to try and cut the lead down. So I know that that Tom Orr eviscerated Coach Harbaugh, rightfully so, in an article um, for that decision because, again, it just his true conservative nature came shining through at that moment. Yeah, it, it was an interesting call. It was very uh, reminiscent of the calls that uh, you know we saw in the Penn State game from James Franklin, and, and this is why Ohio State has been able to avoid, um, you know the upset loss in division because these these coaches have not embraced the role of spoiler and and played to win the game they've they've played they've played by the book and you can't play by the book when you are playing a team this good precisely i mean it, they it, i think it it became rather evident as we get closer and closer to talking about the second half yeah so the halftime score was uh, 28 to uh, 16 rather than 28 to 13, and it didn't seem like uh, you know that the Wolverines got a boost from that three points going into the locker room. It was uh, it was not a a crowd pleasing uh, decision. It sounded like from the the home faithful, but that that ball was on the five yard line. You've got your 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 senior quarterback has been playing like Joe Montana for the entirety of the first half. You've got a great receiving core. You've got great tight ends that Ohio State wasn't matching up well with. You could throw the ball to the running backs out of the backfield. You had not had any trouble protecting. So that that really, all of those things added together, those are supposed to be absorbed over the course of the game by the coach. The coach sees what's going on. Is supposed to be processing this and knowing all of those things were in Harbaugh's back pocket he turtled and decided to kick the field goal and and I said awesome you know because I at that point I didn't think the game was over but I did feel a lot more comfortable about the game at that point yeah I, I certainly felt more comfortable at that point and I'm glad you referenced you know Shea Patterson was was off to a terrific start uh, in the second half, as we will discuss, I mean, it was truly a tale of two halves. Uh, the Ohio State coaching staff made some adjustments, uh, and you know, Shea Patterson, you know, not entirely his fault. I mean, I think he played about as well as he possibly could. But um, it was nice to see that in the second half, Ohio State came out with you know a definite a- adjustment defensively to kind of slow down what had been so successful for the Wolverines in the first half. Yeah, and Ryan Day wasted no time in showing uh, Jim Harbaugh what a terrible uh, decision that was to go for the field goal because uh, the Buckeyes needed uh, six plays and three minutes, 42 seconds to tack on another touchdown, a, a, a really beautiful pass from Justin Fields to K.J. Hill, uh, who quietly had a, a nice day. Very very quiet day, but very, like you said, very efficient day. And it, it was uh, very timely, it, you know, like you said, you kind of, uh, if there was any possible threat of the Wolverines regaining momentum, that drive, I mean, pretty much extinguished it right there. It really uh, was just about done and dusted at that point, uh, but there was a little bit of drama left to come because um, on the next Ohio State drive, the I think it was the next one, it might have been the one after, might have been exchange of punts first, but uh, uh, a... a you know, it was one of those second and one plays where you, where I started to get to the point where it's 35-16, just give it to J.K., and on second and one they decided to throw the ball, 
and the uh, tight end was pushed back into Justin Fields, who went down grabbing his knee, and the entire world just stopped. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not laughing because that, that's I, I think that that's very accurate. I'm sure that uh, you know, like you said, we were watching it from uh, the comfort of um, from of home. You know, we weren't in Michigan Stadium, so we have no idea if all of the oxygen was completely drained out of the Ohio State faithful who made the trek into enemy territory. But uh, it certainly did seem very, very disconcerting at that point. Um, at that moment, I, I did re- make the statement that this is why I'm always such a big advocate about playing the backups because you never know. And I do to Chris Chuganoff's credit. Uh, he came in and did what he needed to do, um, you know, for for the for the few plays that he was in while while uh, Justin Fields was being tended to. Yeah, Chuganoff was not covered in glory from his outing at Rutgers. Um, he, he didn't have a particularly good outing uh, in that game in his most recent game going into that, and and so I'm running through scenarios in my head. I'm like, if if Fields is out, you know, the Buckeyes probably hold on to this when. Maybe it gets a little dicey at the end. All this is running through my head as, as I'm watching Chuganoff and and the offense. And you know, then then you're thinking ahead to next week. Okay, Minnesota or Wisconsin. Maybe the Buckeyes' defense is good enough to where we can win that and and still get in the playoff. But I don't see this team winning a playoff game with Chuganoff. And 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 then around the time where this was still kind of going through my head. Uh, Chuganoff makes a nice throw. Well, actually, it wasn't a great throw. It was a low throw, but it was a completion for a first down. And then Justin Fields is out of the tent, and he's got his helmet on, and you're going, whoa, because a minute ago he's on the turf grabbing his knee, and and for all all the world it didn't seem like anything good was going to happen from that point on. And he comes back on the field, and... All he does is throw a 30-yard touchdown pass uh, perfectly over the defense and uh, hits Garrett Wilson to make it 42-16. to And the thing I would like to add about that touchdown is not only did he come in after sustaining an injury, but he was also he was moving to his left. And, you know, when you think about, all right, the, you know, the, the mechanics of that for a, a right-handed quarterback, uh, you know, moving to his left is not necessarily going to be the most natural of, of throwing motions or positions plus the fact that like i said he was you know he was battling injury he had put on a bulkier uh leg brace to to help him um so like you said he threw a, a he threw a beautiful pass that pretty much ended the game right then and there mm-hmm. it, it was it was a thing of beauty and, and at this point you're thinking that the game's probably over and then uh, of course the buckeyes get a three and out on defense, and you're thinking, yes, this game's definitely over. Now now you're thinking, well, maybe this team scores more than the 60-plus points that it scored last year. And Garrett Wilson muffs a punt. Yes, yes. Uh, careless mistake, I'm sure that that is something that's going to be hammered home to him repeatedly because that's the kind of thing that is, as the, as the games, uh, the importance of the game's uh, continues to rise, you know, the stakes get higher that, you know, those are the kind of things that can, can mean the difference between winning and losing. Now, unfortunately for Ohio State, they had a substantial lead and it did not turn out to be a deciding factor, but it's certainly something that is cause for concern going into the Big Ten Championship. Sure, and I mean, if you you go back in Ohio State history, it's not hard to think of muff punts uh, that have cost Ohio State games and, and championships even. Um, you know, you, you go back to Philly Brown, uh, a game that Ohio State was in control against Clemson. Philly Brown muffs a punt. Clemson comes from behind to win. Um, you go back in the 90s and uh, the Michigan State game, and one of the best Ohio State teams ever loses uh, after Michigan State gets momentum off of a punt that hits someone in the foot, I believe. And you know, these are the things that go through your mind as as longtime Ohio State fans. Um, but uh, the, the the defense came out, did great. Uh, a four play drive went negative one yard, and Quinn Nordine has to kick a field goal. And again, why are you kicking field goals? <laughs> I think in his mind, okay, well we're we're gaining points, but he did not really 
see the the big picture in my estimation. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you make it forty two to nineteen. You're still down twenty three points. Um, again, it, granted, it wasn't an easy fourth down pickup, but uh, you know, I, I think you have to try. And and I think that you know, we talked about this before. I think when you make those decisions, you send a huge message to your players, and, and I don't think it's a good message. I agree with you. I think, I mean, his his lack of confidence in the team to be able to score, uh, you know, I think he, I think he, he basically showed his team what he what he thought their chances were. Mm-hmm. Well, the the uh, Wolverines were able to tack on another touchdown after that in a two point conversion uh, to make it forty two twenty seven. Uh, but then it was all Buckeyes. Uh, by the way, the, the Buckeyes scored 14 points exactly in every quarter um, with uh, the Buckeyes answering the touchdown drive with a drive that uh, ended in an Austin Mack touchdown reception, 16 yards. And uh, then, you know, just to just to dunk on, on Michigan, uh, J.K. Dobbins literally <laughs> with a posterizing run uh, where he jumped in the air and basically dunked on the Wolverines with a 33-yard touchdown run to make it 56-27. And, it, I mean, I've even seen, uh, you know, the animated uh, GIFs or GIFs, however you want to pronounce it, where somebody has, um, has, has like, added in a basketball hoop where <laughs> he jumps up in the air and then the ball goes down through it as if he actually dunked, uh, literally dunked the ball on Michigan. Yeah, I mean, and you and I both know, and I think our listeners know, it could have been worse. I mean, oh, the, yeah. the score, the final score could have been worse. And, you know, we talked about the, okay, you know, just run the ball, burn the clock, which is fine. I have no problem with that. I mean, J.K. Dobbins uh, was a true workhorse, but he, I mean, he did everything exceptionally well in, on Saturday in Ann Arbor. Um, you know, but it was the kind of thing where, you know, in the, in the back of, I was, I was with, uh, extended family i was with uh my sister and and you know being a proud ohio state graduate you know she was saying you know woody hayes he'd, he'd keep going he'd keep going putting on points you know and and i i just think at some point with the big 10 championship on the horizon and a and a you know a playoff berth i think ryan day was basically just kind of like okay let's just you know let's just burn as much time off the clock you know we're gonna win uh, let's just get out of here without any any uh, further injuries. Like they they were fortunate with Justin Fields. I guess like the only other comment I would make about the final score is that not only it could have been worse, but I, I guess if you want to look at it as potentially as somewhat insulting, is that Ohio State had put in their second string, you know, just basically saying like, yeah, you know, like you know, we're that confident. You know, like there's nothing you can do, you know, to stop us. We're just going to put our backups in just to kill the clock. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of, you know, maybe I don't want to call it insulting, but just basically, it's like, man, we've got this. I mean, that just, just come and take your whooping and, and let's call it a call it a day. Yeah, it's what you know. I don't even think that the Buckeyes were particularly trying to score all that hard when Dobbins broke the 33 yarder. They were just kind of, you know, being conservative, running clock, and he. He just saw this gaping hole outside and cut it to his right, and all of a sudden he was in the end zone. Yeah, I agree with you. By the way, why on earth, of all the plays that got reviewed that day, was that the one you would review? <laughs> I couldn't begin to tell you. I mean, that was. I mean, it. I, you know, I I know that they they want to review the touchdowns, but I mean, it was it was as clear as day that he had broken the plane he wasn't out of bounds i mean it just made me wonder yeah i'm i'm like you i i don't understand what they were thinking it was it was pretty insane uh it looked from every angle pretty obviously like a touchdown and and then it the 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 review seemed to last a lot longer than it should have been um so of course that one went ohio state's way the the review of uh of Jordan Fuller's uh, initially called targeting uh, was uh, overturned, and I think rightfully so. I think that's a case of a, a safety coming up to try to make a hit. The receiver ducks his head into the hit and initiates the contact because you know part of that forcible contact in you know in the head or neck region, 
you know, if the if the if the receiver's going to dip into that hit, that's how it becomes a hit to the head. If he stays upright, and it looked like Jordan Fuller stayed, I, I guess about eighty percent upright, like his knees were bent, but he wasn't like ducking down. He didn't like stick the the crown of his helmet down or anything. Uh, and it looked to me like that was only a hit to the head because the the receiver ducked into it. Oh, I agree. I I was glad to see that they overturned it because the whole targeting fiasco that I mean that what that call is and I'm all for player safety you know that but uh, you know we we lament not knowing what is targeting you know it, it, it certainly seems as though that the definition of it changes considerably week to week so I was happy to see that Jordan Fuller was not kicked out of that game because that would have meant he would have missed the first half of the Big Ten championship so I'm, I'm happy that they made the right decision in, in overturning that call yeah same here and um it was an interestingly officiated game. We talk about the holding, and you know we're we're used to, you know we've we've lived through the Bosa's, we lived through Chase Young, and we've seen that uh, these calls don't get made for the holding. But the the one that was curious to me, and the officials even and they huddled up about this, uh, was on one of Michigan's scoring drives where they did not decide to call a a an intentional grounding penalty on Shea Patterson, who was clearly still inside the tackle box, clearly didn't get the ball to the line of scrimmage and clearly got the ball nowhere near a receiver. That's the trifecta. All three parts of of intentional grounding were present, and it would have been a, a very sizable loss because he backtracked on the play. He didn't run outside. He just ran backwards and gave ground, and they, they gave him the incompletion. I, I can't explain that one in a million years. That's every part of the rule. Yeah, I... I can picture that play precisely i mean because i remember it saying oh that, that that's intentional grounding and the next thing you know you know i was just kind of like well he wasn't outside of the tackle box so I, I wasn't sure how the officials missed that one and, and the official that uh, you know there was an official near where the ball landed and it didn't reach the official who was standing near the line of scrimmage so he knew that the ball didn't reach the line of scrimmage and he also could very easily look around and see there was no one in a home uniform in the area. So, I mean, it, it is what it is. I, I don't want to pile on, but I thought that was a talking point at the time because, again, Michigan did score on the drive. So, you know, again, like you said, it could have been worse. And, you know, if anybody wants to say, you know, you're a homer or, you know, everybody complains about the officials, no one thinks the officials are good, I actually went back to look to see if maybe, is this just me? And so I went back specifically to look at holding. And I found some very interesting, uh, I made some interesting discoveries. This was a very quick little five to ten minute review of every box score with the, with all the play-by-play. And what I found, Chip, was that this season, uh, Ohio State has been called for, uh, ha- has been penalized, accepted holding, offensive holding calls, 14 times this season. Four just alone by Thayer Munford, including one in this game. And Ohio State's opponents have been marched backwards for holding three times all season. Two of those were in the Northwestern game. That's interesting. The other was in the Rutgers game. Uh, The two in the Northwestern game were on running plays, so they weren't even in pass protection. So that means that only in the Rutgers game was there a flag that was accepted for holding on a pass play against Ohio State's pass rush. I believe it was against Chase Young, uh, holding Chase Young, but I'm not not positive. I'm going on memory on that one. There was another flag for holding on a pass play in the Penn State game, but that came on fourth and long on Penn State's last drive, and of course Ohio State declined that because the ball was incomplete. Uh, So um, I, I find that interesting that Thera Munford has more holding penalties uh, marked marked off this year than all of Ohio State's opponents combined. Yeah, I mean, it just makes you wonder. I mean, for all of the complaints that we have about officials, I mean, for you to be able to kind of cite statistics like that, it does make you wonder, you know, what are the officials, what are they seeing, or more, you know, more accurately, what are they not seeing? 
Well, in my Twitter, if you go to uh, at Mike36Fan on Twitter, you can find the thread But where I talked about these. Uh, there are two very blatant holds, uh, one in the Michigan game, one in the Penn State game, uh, that are, are you know photographic evidence of two plays that were not called holding. And um, I went back, I thought it was interesting that the first three games this year against FAU, Cincinnati, and Indiana, there were zero offensive holding calls against Ohio State opponents but six defensive holding calls. So they're like grabbing our receivers and they're seeing that, but they're not, uh, they're not seeing uh, guys uh, grabbing Chase Young and, and um, you know, Friday and Smith and Cooper and all these guys. So uh, I just thought all of this was interesting. So you can, you can say that, you know, Ohio state fans whine about the officiating, but I'm backing it up with the numbers. The actual numbers say 14 to three. And I don't even think 14 is a particularly high number of holding calls for an entire season. I'm pretty sure Ohio State's gotten away with some holding. But I think on the balance, it's pretty fair to say Ohio State's opponents have gotten away with far more holding. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. So I don't want to beat that into the ground. I just came up with that research today and wanted to share it. So, you know, do with it what you will completely ignore it if you want uh fantastic day statistically for the Buckeyes and you and I are geniuses because my pick to click uh on offense was the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Week J.K. Dobbins and all he did was uh carry for 211 yards and four touchdowns and uh, he had uh, another uh, let's see how much did he have through the air 49 more yards through the air so, a uh, pretty, pretty good day for J.K. Dobbins. Yeah, completely. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, J.K. Dobbins, he was the workhorse that uh, we we anticipated, and he came shining through. I mean, like, in terms of, I mean, he, he was what made that victory possible, without I believe, a doubt. Uh, I believe he's just the fourth Buckeye to rush for 200 yards in the game, and I think all of them have come since 2007. I believe it's... Uh, Ezekiel Elliott, Carlos Hyde, and um, Chris Wells. I believe yeah. those are the other three. So congrats to J.K. Dobbins having a fantastic uh, end to the season, uh, the regular season. That is, Justin Fields was your pick to click, and uh, a little bit scary early. It took him a while to get going, just 14 of 25, which is not great, but 302 yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions, and sacked just once. Uh, I'd say Justin Fields clicked like uh, an emmer effer. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that as well. All right. Um, so good day for Justin Fields. Uh, on the opposite side, uh, Shea Patterson, 18 of 43. He's, he was what, like 14 of 19 in the first half? Yes. And threw for uh, a ridiculous number. It was over 200 yards, 250 yards, I think, in the first half. It was like 4 of 22 in the second half. And so he ends up with 18, 18 of 43, one interception thrown to Amir Reap. Congratulations to Amir Reap, who was uh, picked on a bit in the first half. Uh, 305 yards, which is a lot of yards, but considering almost all of that came in the first half, uh, that's kind of important, and only one touchdown. I will say that in the second half, he was the victim of a lot of drops, that um, Patterson had a lot of drops in the second half. I remember for sure he had three, and I think I think Peoples Jones had two. Ronnie Bell had one, but the thing that I noticed Ohio State doing differently was it looked to me like they said, "Okay, we're not getting pressure on the outside." It looked like they ran some stuff to get pressure up the middle, and it looked like Patterson got really nervous, and he was throwing a lot of passes off his back foot, uh, missing open guys because you know he was again not using good mechanics. Uh, getting a little bit of happy feet back there, getting a little nervous. And once he, he got nervous and got rattled a little bit, he had trouble getting back to it. Yes, he, he was victimized with some drops. Ohio State had some too. I think Olave got hit in the face mask with uh, one pass that you're like, I'm not sure how he didn't catch that. It hit him right in the face. But um, So I agree that, yeah, he, he, he had a couple that his teammates didn't help him out on, but he reverted. I, I think if you take the the Joe Montana-like or Tom Brady-like first half that he had, he definitely reverted back to the median. Oh, certainly. Like I said, I I, I definitely think um, 
he he was a, a a big contributor to the poor play offensively in the second half. I just know, like Donovan Peoples Jones, he was one of those guys that uh, Ohio State actively recruited and did not get. Um, you know, for pure talent's sake, like I've heard Urban Meyer say, like Donovan Peoples Jones, he he is a possible projected first round draft choice mm-hmm. in the NFL whenever he does come out. Um, my point being that, yeah, like, you know, Peoples Jones, it seemed as though, I mean, just some of the, some of the things that he was doing in the first half, all of a sudden he was not doing in the second half. Like you, you mentioned Ronnie Bell. So, Hey, I'm not complaining. Like I said earlier. Right. Um, Hassan Haskins was the big rusher for Michigan. Uh, 12 carries for 78 yards, uh, six and a half yards per carry, uh, which was almost as good as JK's 6.8 yards a carry but really, really helped by one 33-yard run uh, to really skew the, uh, you know, the numbers there because otherwise he's, he's down to, what, uh, 45 yards on 11 carries, which is, is fairly pedestrian for the game, I think. So I think overall Ohio State did a good job of stopping the run. Uh, there were a couple of times where there was one where Baron Browning missed a tackle and it, it led to a long run and and that kind of thing. But I think overall the Buckeyes did well against the, uh, the rushing game for Michigan. And we expected that uh, on the receiving end last year's breakout man was Chris Olave, who had uh, two catches, 68 yards and a touchdown on Saturday. This year's breakout man was Garrett Wilson, three catches, 118 yards and a touchdown. Uh, other than the muff punt, he had a great day. Yes, he did. Like it, we, we talked about the, the muff punt earlier and hopefully he gets his, concentration and gear for Saturday in Indianapolis, but you're absolutely correct. He had a wonderful, he had a, a terrific day. For the Wolverines, uh, Ronnie Bell, six catches, 78 yards, no touchdowns. That's about what Ronnie Bell typically does, and considering the fact that he's the guy that would have been uh, Sean Wade's responsibility much of the day, um, that's actually a decent job by Ohio State overall. Uh, Peoples-Jones had only three catches, but 69 yards and a touchdown. Um, the 25 yards of that was the touchdown. Um, uh, not a huge day for Sean McCune. Uh, three catches uh, for 66 yards. My cat agrees with that. Th- three uh, three catches, 66 yards, no touchdowns. Um, Nico Collins, very, very quiet day. Jeff Okuda did a great job on him. Yeah, it it was um, it was distressing at, at at the at the first half. Uh, hopefully, the the coaching staff because you you have to you have to kind of take into consideration that Wisconsin, they're going to try to do some of the things that worked well against Ohio state. Uh, and we already talked about the absence of Sean Wade being a, a, a contribution to that. But uh, let's hope that Ohio state, like I said, that they um, have realized, all right, maybe we need to do some different things coverage wise when it comes to, you know, trying to cover wide receivers with, with a linebacker or, you know, like, you know, tight ends, you know, like we might need to do some things differently. All right, let's get to our defensive picks to click uh, in this game, Chip. I picked Baron Browning. He was the leading tackler for Ohio State. Six solos, seven total tackles, one and a half tackles for loss. He did have the, the missed uh, tackle that led to uh, one of uh, Michigan's longer runs on the day, but I'd say overall he clicked. Yeah, I agree with that. I didn't have no problem with that. Uh, big day for Devon Hamilton. He had uh, a sack, two tackles for loss, five uh, overall tackles. Jordan Fuller, five tackles, was a a real beast in the secondary. Uh, you selected Pete Werner as your pick to click. I'm going to let you be the judge. He did have a tackle for loss. He did have three solo tackles, four total tackles. Uh, but he did get abused a little bit in the first half. In fact, he he got caught uh, looking for a run and allowed a long pass to the tight end. Yeah, I would, I would say he did not click. Yeah, it wasn't the best game for Pete, although... Um, he had a good second half, I would say. Yeah, he improved like the rest of the defense. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that was uh, that was it for the game, man. It's uh, it's eight in a row. Um, there's no word yet as to whether Ryan Day is opening up the one and zero pint house. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe they'll just brew him a special beer or something. How's that? That'd be good. Um, Jim Harbaugh is zero and five, and. He got a little salty when asked uh, why there was such a big gap between Ohio State and Michigan. Well, he doesn't want to acknowledge the truth, and it is. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of talent. Uh, I know that we'll talk about recruiting later on in the month uh, when it actually comes to pass, but uh, 
you know, all the, the national media not even you know taking uh, Ohio State or Michigan beat writers uh, into consideration. The national media, you know, like they they could see, you know, when I, I say the national media, I'm talking like Yahoo Sports and Sports Illustrated and The Athletic and all these, you know, they could see the talent discrepancy, and that's basically he can he can be salty with with uh, with the media after the game. As, as much as he wants but you know two years in a row his his team has been soundly beaten has given up better than 50 some points uh has given up better than you know 500 yards of offense i mean it's 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 as obvious as as the nose on your face so you know he can he can be uh upset and distraught about it but that's until the talent gap improves uh, you're you're going to see more and more results like this, and by and large, it would not be, um, you know, based on the early projections of the recruiting uh, going into 2020. It wouldn't be a shock that we have a similar result like we've had the last two years next year uh, in Columbus, and a new quarterback for Michigan next year, um, a new first year starter. Chip, it sounded to me like the, you know the. The reporter just wanted to get at why is there a gap? Why are you getting beaten in these lopsided, in this lopsided manner? What is the what is the difference between the two teams? And you know Harbaugh can be petulant and, and say you know I'm I'm not going to answer insults. I'll answer questions is what he said. But I mean I think that's a legitimate question. A reporter doing his job saying look what you know this keeps happening. What is the problem and how do you solve it? Basically is what the, the reporter is trying to get at. Oh yeah, I mean it. You know, when you look back over the five years, you know, like the the first year Ohio State blew the doors off off of them up in Ann Arbor in 2015, and then you know the the overtime, you know, like the they they can say, oh, you know, but like the questionable, you know, the the questionable spot, uh, you know, in 2016, and then you know in 2017, Ohio State they were able to go back up there and lose J T Barrett. And bring in Dwayne Haskins cold off the bench and, and beat them not nearly as soundly as they have the last two years, but I mean it's it's there. It you know you you can't ignore the fact that Ohio State's been clearly dominant since he uh, you know not not even so much since he's returned to Ann Arbor, but just you know the results speak for themselves eight in a row. Yeah, and and you know you have recruits come to these big games and. If you got a recruit sitting on the sideline with an offer in his pocket from Ohio State and an offer in his pocket from Michigan, and he sees this game, I think the choice is pretty clear. Oh, it is. It, uh, you know, I thought that uh, Gerd and Tom made a really good point on you know the Buckeye Weekly podcast that um, I think immediately after the game, and they said something along the lines of last year when the game was in Columbus, supposedly Zach Harrison was trending towards Michigan. You know, he, I mean, he was at the game and, you know, even though he was a guest, I, I believe of Ohio state, you know, was the, the thought and the suspicion was, Oh, he's, he's leaning towards Michigan. And then shortly after that game, kind of surprisingly like, Oh, you know, like he kind of started trending away from Michigan and, and eventually signed with Ohio state. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of talent. I, I, genuinely don't know like how many as you said how many of those recruits have offers from both schools but it has to make you stop and think like okay this is eight years in a row look at how they've been beaten the last two years in a row do i really want to come and be a part of this if i have the opportunity to go to ohio state why wouldn't i choose to be a buckeye instead yeah i mean it 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 does it does make it more difficult it does make jim harbaugh's job more difficult i think but um uh, after the game, also, uh, when asked about the the rivalry and uh, and why Ohio State's been so successful, and, and and you know, we heard this year that Don Brown had said, you know, that that Michigan had been planning for this all year, and we thought, well, maybe they finally get it. Maybe they finally get how Ohio State's been successful by making this a point of emphasis, not for a week, and not just when fall camp starts, but every day 365 days a year every year and maybe they finally get that and yet after the game justin Fields said they don't take it as seriously as we do and i think Fine. that uh, I, I think that the perfect illustration of that was in this game because jonathan cooper 
Chip is redshirting, and he had one game left to play. This is a team that might make the national championship game. Jonathan Cooper chose to play in this game, and that shows you what it means to these players. Here's a guy who could play for national championship and maybe be a difference maker in the final game uh, on the last day of college football. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to worry about if we get there. I want to play in this game. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, I certainly believe that it does mean more um, even before the results of this of this past weekend. I seem to recall maybe last winter, may, it, may, it had to have been at least – during the winter workouts that Greg Madison, who, who came over from, you know, from, from Michigan to be Ohio state's defensive line coach, um, and, and, you know, a co-coordinator, um, I should say defensive line coach, cause that's Larry Johnson's domain. But I know that that's kind of his expertise, uh, that Greg Madison freely admitted. Yeah. You know, like the intensity of the workouts, the intensity of the rivalry, everything at Ohio State was far more than anything he had experienced up in Ann Arbor. So, yeah, I, I completely agree with Justin Fields' assessment. All right, 56-27. Uh, that is a, a lopsided score. That is a covering the spread score. Yes. All right, the Buckeyes move on now to the Big Ten Championship where they will face wisconsin for the second time this year first time they've got an in-season rematch in a long time we'll get to that later in the program uh jeff halfley was named as a finalist for the broyles award for the top assistant coach in the country and my question to you chip is not whether or not halfley deserves to be there because obviously he does it is uh why doesn't uh the offensive coordinator for Ohio State and Greg Madison, why are they getting snubbed? <laughs> Good question. Good question. I, I I think I think when it comes to the op, I, I I can address the offensive coordinator simply, uh, maybe a little easier simply from the fact that Ryan Day is still calling the plays. Mm-hmm. You know that I think he's probably getting the credit uh, for you know the play calling because that's something that he still wants to do it remains to be seen if in year two and beyond if he's going to relinquish that as far as greg madison i think he probably should get more of the credit but i maybe it comes down to the fact that jeff halfley his expertise is in the secondary and there's been such a marked improvement in that area that maybe that shines a brighter light on jeff halfley's contributions than greg madison's but i think he raised some interesting points I think a lot of the reason why the secondary is much better this year is uh, number two. <laughs> Very good point. Very good point. <laughs> not saying that they're not playing lights out because uh, you got Damon Arnett, Jeffrey Okuda, and, and Sean Wade all playing like they're going to be first half of the first round draft picks in the NFL draft. Um you know, obviously that's going to play a major factor, but it also is very helpful when you only have to cover a receiver for about three or four seconds. Yes, precisely. <laughs> so I would say, as Greg Madison is the defensive coordinator, um, probably some credit due there, I think. I Yeah, I think you're on to something. All right, uh, let us move on in our uh, topics then to... Uh, we already talked about uh, J.K. Dobbins being the uh, Big Ten Offensive Player of the Week. He was, of course, the uh, Offensive Player of the Game for Ohio State, co-Offensive Player of the Game with Justin Fields. Uh, the co-Defensive Players of the Game for the Buckeyes were Jeffrey Okuda and Devon Hamilton. And um, I think all of that is extremely deserved. This is, by the way, the fourth time that Dobbins has won the uh, Big Ten Player of the Week on offense. So congrats to J.K. And uh, the big news early this week, Chip, is that Sean Wade is expected to play Saturday in Indianapolis. And I'm going to be kind of anxious to see how I, – I, that's that's great news, by the way. I'm not trying to uh, downplay that because uh, that is terrific news, is um, – Depending on how the game goes for Ohio State, I wouldn't be surprised if Ohio State tries to rest Sean Wade as well as the starters as much as possible if they get out to a commanding lead. I'm not saying necessarily that that's going to be the case. I mean, it was and when they 
when they previously played Wisconsin. Uh, but depending on what type of injury this is, since Ryan Day and the coaching staff have been so close-lipped about injuries all year, uh, not knowing the severity of what what is afflicting Sean Wade, hopefully it, it will be something where he can contribute uh, in the Big Ten Championship and then uh, be healthy to go uh, in whatever playoff game uh, Ohio State gets slated to. Yeah, the good news here, too, is that um, Wisconsin's offense is not the same kind of offense uh, in terms of how to stop it. And I think that the Buckeyes could probably get by with a lot less Sean Wade against the Badgers than they could against uh, against Michigan, and, and they're much more uh, talented uh, receiving core. Yeah, and the fact that it's going to be indoors – in Indianapolis where, you know, we all know that, okay, when they first met at the end of October, it was, you know, it was, uh, rainy. I mean, when it rains, it rains on both teams. You know, I don't, I don't want to make excuses for Wisconsin because Ohio state had to play in it as well. But, um, I think, you know, it could be, I think it might be a little different outcome for both teams in the sense that, that, you know, the weather is not going to be a factor whatsoever. Yeah, and I think that a sloppy game probably hinders Ohio State more than Wisconsin in what they try to do. I think that Wisconsin would like to run the ball and play defense and, and, and you know, use the passing game sparingly, and it's a fairly short passing game usually. And Ohio State likes to take their shots down the field and use the, you know, use all of the offense and all of the weapons and move the ball around and spray it around, and I think that's a lot easier to do in uh, an indoor stadium than it is to do, you know, in a windy, rainy environment. Completely agree. All right. Before we get to the Badgers, though, um, and the the Badgers and the Buckeyes for, what is this, the third time in like the last five years that these two teams have met in the Big Ten Championship? You got it. That seems like a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's, uh, well, that's the thing. Like, I mean, uh, when you know the fact that they played uh the legendary 2014 game where Ohio State blew them out uh they, they played a couple of years ago in 2017 uh if you think that it seems like an awful lot Wisconsin it's pretty much it's been uh you know even though Ohio State's starting to make it uh a habit and I'm not complaining about uh Ohio State going to the Big Ten Championship Wisconsin this is like their home away from home um they, they pretty much always are representing the West Division of the Big Ten, uh, with the exception being um, in 2015 with with Iowa as well as in uh, last year with North, Northwestern. Every other year, it's been it's been Wisconsin. So just kind of goes to show how dominant the Badgers have been in the West Division. All right, let's quickly go around the Big Ten uh, this weekend and – We'll start with some of the more underwhelming performances. Uh, Michigan State with a 1916 home win over Maryland. Uh, why is Michigan State struggling to beat Maryland? That game, I mean, it was. <laughs> I think it kind of represented how just how far Michigan State has fallen in terms of just their, I mean, their their talent level, their offensive. Uh, uh, schematics. I mean everything. So I mean to uh, to struggle to beat Maryland, to wind up six and six, to more than likely wind up in I, I and forgive me, I can't remember the official name, but you know, like whatever the bowl game is, uh, you know, for in Detroit because that's where I have a feeling Michigan State's going to be ticketed to. Um, you know, it just Michigan State's got a long way to go. Indeed. Um... The other underwhelming game was Penn State with a little bit of Ohio State hangover uh, with a 27-6 win over Rutgers, needing to pull away in the second half uh, in a game that was 7-3 at halftime. Yeah, with uh, Penn State, they were without Sean Clifford at quarterback. They re- resorted to Will Levis, who did a fine job running the ball. You know, he, you know, I, th- I think he went over 100 um carrying the ball but it kind of goes to show you know he's not nearly the passing threat uh that sean clifford is uh it was an underwhelming game um you know rutgers it, it's not official yet but uh the greg Schiano back to rutgers 
Um, maybe we can start calling him codename Lazarus because it, you know, like that deal has come back from the dead. Uh, you know, he uh, it was all written off, and then it was the complete opposite uh, of a few years ago when Greg Schiano fan outcry derailed him from being the head coach of Tennessee. Well, the fan outcry of him not being named the head coach at Rutgers made the administration supposedly reverse their course. So, uh, like I said a moment ago, it's not official, but it should be like within the next day or two, Greg Schiano will be the, the uh, head coach again at Rutgers. Was that not just the year before last? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, it's just... so Tennessee, Rutgers is the anti-Tennessee. Tennessee's fans got uh, their administration to go back on an offer uh, to hire Greg Schiano, and Rutgers got their administration to go back on uh, declining to offer uh, Greg Schiano a job. So that's interesting. Uh, but yeah, 27-6. Uh, you know, when Johnny Langan is your top quarterback in the game, 12 of 24, 164 yards, you know Will Levis didn't get a lot done in the air. Uh, so, uh, But, you know, Penn State did pull it out, and they are now at 10 wins. So congratulations to uh, the Nittany Lions for reaching double digits. And uh, Rutgers, uh, well... <sighs> It's going to be a long road. I, I honestly believe I've been. Th- let's talk about this for a minute because I, I was thinking about this. Of all times to think about this was on the drive to work this morning. <laughs> um, I was thinking about Rutgers football on the drive to work this morning, and, and I really think that there's only one way forward for Rutgers, and I don't think I, I don't believe that Greg Schiano is going to get this program back to even where he had it. I don't believe it's possible in the Big Ten for them to get to that level. But I do think that Greg Schiano, although I don't think he can be the guy, I think he can be the guy that leads to the guy. And the only way that you can really do that is this. If you're Rutgers, you have to you have to overcome the stigma of being Rutgers and and all of the baggage that that that, you know, kind of comes with that. And that's from years and years and years of being inept. And the only way to do that is to distinguish yourself somehow. Now, there's two ways you can really do that. Uh, there's two things you can do that has nothing to do with recruiting. And both of these things help with that. One of them is go around the country, see what everybody's got, and beat it. What are your facilities? We can do better. Go out and whatever crazy things are going on, Alabama's waterfall or whatever, uh, Clemson, I think, has a slide. Whatever they have, double it. Just throw crap tons of money at it and build the facility to end all facilities. And yes, it's going to be hard to get that paid for. Yes, you're going to have to you're going to have to do a lot of fundraising. Um, but if you get that, that will help you. The other thing you need to spend money at uh, on and throw money at is assistant coaches because if you can pay Shiano's assistants enough money, that even if you don't get the top recruits, you may be able to develop your recruits better than other you know better than other schools can does that make sense yeah absolutely so you, i you, you have these you have these uh, you know very good uh teachers of the game and you bring them in and you say look we're going to pay you a lot of money to be our assistant coach and it's going to be enough money to where they're not going to be oh is there a job open at temple you know I, well, i'd like to be a head coach but i'm making too much money here or whatever so now you've got people that are that are, are are steady and stable. You've got a stable regime, and you're developing your talent, and and maybe you're keeping a few of those New Jersey guys home, and that's how you become competitive. But I still don't think Rutgers is ever going to be. I, I don't foresee Rutgers winning the Big Ten East in the next twenty years. No, not at all. And like I said, it's 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 a step in the right direction, but it's a long long process Mm -hmm. it really is but you know that's what you have when you have had years of being terrible is Mm -hmm. you have that long process because we've seen teams rise above their station in the past sometimes it doesn't last very long but it does take a concerted effort to to just stay at it it's it's difficult because you're not going to get results right away, so you have to fight the urge to go. Oh, well, we got to fire this guy. You you have to fight against that and against your instinct to say a head needs to roll so I can appease some people. You you have to just say, look, we're going to stay the course. We're going to do this, and we're going to do it this way. But I don't think you can just do it 
the normal way that you would do it at another school. Like even a school like Missouri, it's probably easier to build a winning team at Missouri than it is to, to build one at Rutgers. You have to you have to wow them somehow, and I think you really need those facilities to be the, the, the first step to that. We'll see. Like I said, I think it's a long process. Yeah. All right. Let us move on to the, the other Big Ten games. Indiana and Purdue played for a bucket. Yes, and Indiana – uh, prevailed, and this is, I believe I saw on uh, the Big Ten Network, this is the first eight-win season for Indiana since 1993, if I'm not mistaken. Congratulations to Tom Allen for Big Ten Coach of the Year. Yeah, more than likely. I'd be surprised <laughs> if it was anyone else. Uh, he's got some competition from P.J. Fleck, but, uh, you know, you know Ryan Day ain't winning it, so... Because uh, that would just be admitting that the guy who has the best season and and does the best job with recruiting and all those other things that go along with it and wins the actual games, that's not as important as finishing with a better record than people thought you were going to finish with. Right. So uh, congratulations to the Hoosiers in two overtimes. They win the old oak and bucket 44-41. So I don't know what you – what do you keep in that thing? <laughs> you like put like oranges or something in it, fruit? I don't think you put anything in it. I think it's it's you know just it's uh, just for for show. I think I'm not sure. Do you maybe lose the game if you don't feel like having the bucket anymore? You're like, oh, no. Things. I think that's how I think that's how jobs are lost. That thing's an so. eyesore. I don't want that thing in my athletic facility. Um, you know, you and I talked about the the Abe Lincoln hat last week and it was the it was found to be the land of lincoln trophy yes and it was not won by the illinois fighting illini who uh kind of uh came back to earth after a nice run uh they fell to six and six with a 29 10 loss at home to a terrible northwestern team that finally won a big 10 game yeah, I'm happy for Northwestern that they finished the season on a positive note. It's very disappointing, though, for Illinois, who were riding high based on their, you know, their their upset of Wisconsin. You know, like the 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 way that they played earlier in the year that that sparked them to get to bowl eligibility, and for them to to come out and lose to a very poor Northwestern team that was riddled with injuries to the to the fact that. Uh, they had a backup defensive back by the name of Coco Azima for Northwestern come in, uh, run for over 120 yards and a touchdown. Um, it just seems as though Illinois kept their they, – they took their eye off uh, the focus of this game. And uh, like Michigan State, they're limping into the to the bowl games uh, scene, you know, at 6-6. Six and six. Who's to say, like, they might get that quick lane bowl up in Detroit uh, instead of Michigan State? I'd be surprised. Um, cause you would think that the quick lane bowl would want to capitalize on the hometown team. But, uh, yeah, Illinois did not really necessarily give a lot of optimism for their performance heading into bowl game season. You know, if you've got dry cracked skin, you could use some cocoa azima. There you go. There you that go. Sound, that totally sounds like something you would put on your, put on your face to moisturize. I, I could see it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know how to react to me tonight, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, all right, so uh, that brings us to Farmageddon with Iowa visiting Nebraska. This is a game that Iowa had wrapped up at halftime, a 24-10 uh, a to 10 lead, and then all of a sudden they did not have a 24-10 to 10 lead. It was 24-24 after three quarters, and Iowa with a field goal to win it, 27-24, to get to nine victories and assure uh, an automatic 10 more years onto Kirk Ferentz's contract. Yeah, it was a disappointing end of the season for Nebraska. Uh, you know, they'll be sitting at home um, with a 5-7 and seven record. Uh, they're getting better, but they, they still need better recruits. They need a better defense, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, to p- truly start to make positive strides within the Big Ten West. Yeah. And let's stay in the Big Ten West for the final uh, game uh, of the weekend that we will talk about, and that is the the right to play Ohio State in Indianapolis came down to Wisconsin at Minnesota, 
and uh, the Gophers struck first and led 7-0 after the first quarter. Uh, Wisconsin fought back in the second half. It was 10-7 Wisconsin at halftime, and then just too much Wisconsin in the second half. Minnesota got worn down. Uh, they made too many mistakes on offense. They could not stop the uh, running uh, running game of Jonathan Taylor in the short passing game of Wisconsin, and uh, they, they I believe they turned the ball over a few times in that second half as well, and Wisconsin wins 38-17 a surprisingly lopsided score to me. Yeah, very very surprising lopsided score. And Minnesota, they uh, started off obviously, you know, with you know, they're arguably the the best season in in school history. And down the stretch, you know, kind of faltered with you know the loss to Iowa and obviously, the, as you said, this lopsided loss to Wisconsin. But it, it shouldn't take away from the fact that they won ten games for the first time, and I I want to say at least. Uh, 14 years. I remember there was a 2005 team. I'm, I don't have it in front of me, but I remember when Glenn Mason was the head coach. They had a, a very good team that um, I'm not sure exactly what their final record was, but I want to say that they won 10 games. But um, remains to be seen what bowl game Minnesota is going to get. It should be a good one with 10 wins. Uh, you know, you got to figure that the Golden Gophers are going to travel well. Uh, considering the fact that this is their most successful season in, in several years. Uh, but now it's on to Wisconsin for Ohio State, uh, a rematch uh, in the Big Ten Championship. Uh, and we'll see uh, if the if the Buckeyes can make it uh, two times in a row uh, in, in one season. Yeah, you and I talked uh, a while back about the, the Minnesota North, uh, the, the Minnesota schedule in, in November. Um, really having trouble speaking all of a sudden but the the last four games uh all in november the uh, home game against penn state the game at iowa then at northwestern and then home to wisconsin we knew that those four games that that minnesota could lose any of them and and you know based on the the way that they started the season you weren't filled with a lot of confidence about that team but as the season wore on they started to win by bigger and bigger margins, uh, and then when they beat Penn State, you thought, "Wow, this is a team that is legitimate." And then uh, that loss uh, in a very close game at Iowa, um, you know, took a little bit of the starch out of uh, the Gophers, who, who didn't uh, really win convincingly at Northwestern, uh, but they did win the game. And then they, uh, the the game against Wisconsin, they just got. I, I think that was a game you, you saw the I'm sure you saw the the weather it was a, a a true northern battle between those two teams in the snow and I really think that the weather uh, really helped Wisconsin in some ways because I think Wisconsin's not as as much uh, of a passing team as, as Minnesota can be at times and Minnesota didn't really get to to fully weaponize their really good receiving core. I agree with you. I think uh, Wisconsin is better designed to run the ball. Uh, I think at, at this stage, Minnesota is better designed to pass the ball. And as you said, the weather certainly seemed to have more of an impact on Minnesota uh, than it did on Wisconsin. Yeah, and it wasn't like a crazy big day for Jonathan Taylor. He he, he had two touchdowns, but only 76 yards. Yeah. Yeah, he um, was not nearly the uh, nearly the, the, the big – a big play factor that that I think Ohio State fans and college football fans have grown accustomed to seeing from Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. All right. So that's our trip around the Big Ten for this week. Um, Chip, you and I have been asking people, you know, for some time to get their questions in for the Silver Bullets podcast mailbag, and we actually have a question this week. Okay, let's have it. So there's before we do that, I would just want to tell people how they can ask us a question on any uh, for any given podcast, and that is uh, to hit us up on Twitter. I am at Mike Thirty Six Fan, and Chip is at Chip Minnick. Last name is spelled M I N N I C H. Uh, hit us up on Twitter with the hashtag S B P Mailbag, and if you do that, we will certainly answer your question on the show. So this week's uh, question. I actually have to pull up because I got a ton. I was just leaving it in my notifications, and I got an, an absolute crazy ton of uh, <laughs> of uh, 
responses today, notifications, uh, likes and retweets and stuff. So we got a question from Tyler Shoemaker, Buckeye Ty23 on Twitter, uh, and he wants to know, are you more concerned with the first half pass defense or encouraged by the second half adjustments? I will, I guess I'm just going to, I'm going to go on to the, the pessimist side and I'd say I was more concerned with the first half. Uh, simply because one would have thought that they would have made the adjustment sooner, um, you know, seeing what was was what was transpiring there. Now, granted, they did make the adjustment in the second half, uh, and they were much better. But I would have I would have made I would have okay. This is what we're doing is not working. I wouldn't have needed to wait till halftime to make those changes. But that's just me. I think that I'm not overly concerned. Uh, with the first half, nor am I overly encouraged by the second half performance. I think the second half performance is closer to what I expected, but I think in much the way that it took Justin Fields a while to settle down, I think it took Ohio State's young um, replacements in the secondary a while to not only settle down, but also to learn uh, to communicate better with their teammates. I think that there were some missed signals maybe in that first half that led to some big plays. I think there, there were some uh, opportunities for tighter coverage and it, it seemed to me like probably um, partly in the second half they were helped by the by the pass rush getting uh, closer and making Shea Patterson more nervous that was certainly part of it but I think part of it also was that the coverage was better and there were fewer communication breakdowns so I'm not too worried overall by the first half performance partly because I expect Sean Wade back and partly because I think that now they've had an opportunity to learn from this, uh, the, the things that Michigan was able to do, and they can go back and watch film and learn from this. And I, I feel like this coaching staff has done a good job of responding to, you know, anything that has worked against Ohio State. Good point. So, really good point. So that's the way I see it. Uh, Tyler, thanks so much for your question. Again, you can ask us anything with the hashtag SBP mailbag. And uh, so get your Silver Bullets podcast mailbag questions into us at Mike36Fan and at Chip Minnick, M-I-N-N-I-C-H. Follow us on Twitter because I'm, I, I've am i almost, Chip, gotten back all the, the followers I lost in the off season. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. I tend to lose followers. I was like a, I was just over 3,000 followers last year when the season ended, and I went down to like 30 or 29... 60. I lost, like, I was hemorrhaging uh, followers. I'm back up to 3,000 as of right now. So, um, feeling pretty good about that. That's a lot for an idiot like me to have uh, following on Twitter. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm not even one of those verified guys with the blue check mark. How do we, who do we talk to about that? I wouldn't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, thanks again, Tyler, for the question. That brings us to the Big Ten Championship, uh, Chip. And this is a game that uh, is is interesting because when you when you play a team in the regular season, you watch the film, you break them down, you you game plan for them, you go out and you try to execute that game plan, um, and then all of a sudden, boom, you got to play a team again, and you've already shown all the things that you want to show against them. That's true, and I think uh, we touched on it earlier. I think it's going to be a different. Wisconsin team simply because of the fact that it's indoors. Um, I think the the end result's going to be the same. I'm, I'm going to be predicting Ohio State to win. Um, if you want my final score prediction, I can give it right now. But um, I definitely think you know it's it's not necessarily going to be the same. Wisconsin, I think Wisconsin's going to certainly look at what they did well and what they did not do well from the first game they're going to look and see some of the things that other teams like Penn State and Michigan did well and try to incorporate that into their uh, into their game plan so I certainly think Ohio State can win but I would not necessarily presume that it's going to be as nearly a dominant uh, effort uh, by the Buckeyes over the Badgers on Saturday night yeah the the teams met um, in uh, October and Wisconsin uh, came to the horseshoe and lost 38 to seven. The Badgers were ranked 13th in the country at the time. They are back up to 12th. Certainly, and they should be. 
So they are, are looking good. In fact, that Ohio State loss, pretty sure that was the last time they lost. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm saying. I think it, they, they, re, they regrouped. Yeah, they they certainly did. It was, uh, you know, a shocking loss, really, to to see them lose to Illinois. Uh, and, you know, you you wondered, were they looking ahead kind of thing? And, and maybe they were. Maybe Illinois just caught them on a good day. Illinois had a, a pretty good run of form in the middle of the season. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, Wisconsin lost those two games. Then they... They eked out a win against Iowa. Um, they beat Nebraska, not all that convincing, but they did beat them by 16. Uh, they handled Purdue, which they should do. And uh, the, I think probably their most impressive win in this run was against Minnesota team that may have um, may have been hindered by the weather, but may have also just come back to earth a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I think they're I think they're ready. Yeah, so uh, their most impressive win this year was the probably the 35-14 win against Michigan, and they looked really good in that game, and that game was not as close as the final score indicated as uh, Michigan was able to score late. I believe that was 35 nothing, if I'm not mistaken, at one point. Yeah, they um, were crushing them. So uh, not, not uh, you know, this is a team that they hit hard. They never stop. They're relentless. Um, you know, we know what to expect from this team. They're gonna they're gonna try to run Jonathan Taylor. They're gonna play good defense. Uh, again, they they kept Ohio State under forty points. Uh, the weather wasn't fantastic in that game. It shouldn't be an issue in this game. But what is an issue in this game is that Justin Fields is less likely to run the football because of that knee. And uh, you know, he said that he sprained an, an MCL at the end of the Penn State game on that sack play where it looked kind of like it was his ankle, but it was actually his knee that he hurt. So uh, he aggravated that in the Michigan game. And you wonder how injured is a sprained MCL, you know, and how, and how much is it going to, you know, did it swell up this week? You know, is there going to be some problems with it? Um, I, I think there are a lot of question marks. So that's going to throw some, you know, just a bit of a monkey wrench into this game, it, you know, coupled with the fact that, again, Wisconsin has more game film now. Uh, they know how Ohio State's going to attack. They've, they've been able to break that down. And, you know, Jonathan Taylor has not done well against Ohio State, but only in two games. He's been held under 55 yards, I believe, both times. Uh, I would not be surprised to see Jonathan Taylor get loose once or twice because he's that good and because now Wisconsin's had an opportunity to analyze what Ohio State did. Yeah, I, I, I think he's he's certainly due. I'm certain I, he's certainly eager, but I, I have faith that Ohio State's going to do everything they can to bottle him up. All right, so we know what to expect from Wisconsin. Um, they're kind of the same year in and year out. It kind of, to me, comes down to can Ohio State continue to stop the run and can they keep Jack Cohn from making enough plays uh, in the passing game? And uh, so I need your score prediction. I'm going Ohio State 42, Wisconsin 21. 42, 21. Okay. I don't know why. I'm expecting a little bit lower scoring game out of Ohio State here, probably because I don't know about... Uh, Justin Fields' ability to escape the pocket and uh, make plays with his legs in this game. So I'm going to say that this uh, was 38-7 last time. I'm going to say Buckeyes 35, Wisconsin 24. So I think it'll be close, and it might be one of those aggravating games where it's not till the fourth quarter... Uh, where Ohio State gains some separation. Uh, remind me, you said 42... 21. 21. Okay. So when you, usually when you give these to me, Chip, I type them out while you're doing it. And I did okay. that this time. So apologies for making you repeat yourself. Um, so that brings us to the picks to click. And let's see. Let's go back to what we what we picked last time. And the last time Wisconsin and Ohio State played, you picked first on offense and went Chris Olave. And I took K.J. Hill and Tough Borland, and you took Malik Harrison. 
So that seems pretty logical all around. And I'm pretty sure that was a terrible game for K.J. Hill. <laughs> and then K.J. Hill came back and had a, a great game the next week against uh, against Maryland and bounced back. But uh, let me have, let's see, you're going first this week on defense because you went first and took Justin Fields last week. So your pick-to-click chip on defense. I'm going to stick with what I had before. I am going with Malik Harrison. Okay. And that falls to me. I think um, I, I think it's a bounce back game for Chase Young. Chase Young got held. I think he's 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 probably not happy that he had a poor statistical outing and that some of that Heisman Trophy talk might have cooled down a little bit. So I think he bounces back. Like the last time uh, I went with somebody um, that was coming off a bad game, uh, they ended up with a good game. So I'm going to go with Chase. I think he'll make a difference in this game. That brings us uh, back to the offense. Hmm. And I thought last time that this seemed like a K.J. Hill type of game, but K.J. Hill didn't have a great game in that one. They ended up going down the field a little more in that game. I have a weird feeling that this is going to be a game where somebody comes has to come out of nowhere and have a good game. I, I think it's been a long time, and probably too long, for uh, this individual. I'm going to go Ben Victor. Mm. It's, been a, it's been a while since he's had a good game. I think he's due. Okay. What do you got? I'm going to go with somebody who we talked about that uh, his focus and concentration wasn't there. Um, but I'm going to go with Garrett Wilson. I, I, I think um, he's certainly seeming to kind of develop um, as a prime player in the in the wide receiver rotation. So I'm going to go with Garrett Wilson. Okay. We did it backwards this week. We usually pick the, uh, the picks to click for the score prediction. But that's, that's okay. That's okay. Because that was the regular season. This is this is now the championship game. So, you know, got to change things up. Keep it fresh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, here it comes, Chip. I mean, you and I blinked and the regular season ended. <sighs> Always happens this way. It just, I mean, if anything, it just makes it just that, that much more sad, you know, like when you're kind of like, you know, clinging to, you know, like the last shreds of, you know, like with Thanksgiving being last week, you know, kind of like the last shreds of the Thanksgiving Turkey, you know, like, Oh, like, Oh gosh, like I can't believe like it's all gone. Um, same kind of mindset, at least I have that, Oh, it went by so fast and, uh, you got to savor it while you have it. Indeed. You know, we, we've really got to do a better job of rationing our regular season Ohio state games because we, we ran through our entire inventory and uh, you know, if we if we could just ration these out a little better, we might be able to stretch them out. <laughs> I, I wish you were right. <laughs> you know, you're not buying that one, huh? No, nah, sorry. All right. All right. Uh, so we'll come back next week, Chip. We'll talk about the Big Ten Championship game, Ohio State and Wisconsin. Am I hearing this right? Ohio State is considered the visitor in this game. Yes. Well, it's not. It's not so much that they're considered the visitor it's just like every other year the east and west alternate as to who's the home team so this just happens that this is the year that the east is the is the away team Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah ohio state should be if 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 i am not mistaken will be wearing their white jerseys on saturday night what do you think of that rule Why, why not go with the team there should be some tiebreakers here ohio state has the better record and also won the head to head they should be the home team I would agree with you. I just think, you know, like I think that they're just trying to be as as equitable as possible between the two divisions. Let's face it, um, you know, like with Ohio State, this, you know, we both predict Ohio State to win. Mm -hmm. This would be this would be the third year in a row that the East would win. You know what I mean? Like it's it's one of those things, you know, that um, I think that they're just trying to be as as equitable as possible. I mean, I, I go back now that I think about it. If this comes out, just doing some quick math, this would be the the this would be the fifth year in a row because um, Ohio State in 2014, Michigan State 2015, 
Penn State, don't forget, they won the Big Ten East, even though Ohio State got the playoff berth, um, and they they defeated Wisconsin. Um, and then you know you've had the last two years with Ohio State, so I, let, me, let me I guess that would be the sixth year. Let me rephrase that. Mm. So well, if they want to be equitable, Chip, they should call eleven holding penalties on Wisconsin. <laughs> That'll even things up at 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> and Wisconsin is um, a bit of a reputation for, for being a bit handsy. Uh, but uh, we will see what happens on Saturday night in Indianapolis, and we'll come back and talk about that next week. And uh, then by the time you and I speak next week, Chip, we should have official word on Ohio State's status as it uh, it pertains to the, the little thing called the college football playoff. Yeah, that should be Sunday afternoon. I don't ask me what time. I haven't looked that far ahead, but it's usually Sunday after Sunday afternoon, like around I don't know one, two o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. Do you see a scenario where Ohio State doesn't get in? The only way that I see them not getting in is if they suffer the fate of the 2014 Wisconsin Badgers and get completely blown out. That's how I see that happening. So let's say it's 59 nothing Wisconsin. Let's, uh, oh God, let's not even put that out in the universe. But if it was, then Ohio State has split two games with Wisconsin, and they don't do things like soccer with aggregate score. So there would be a split with Ohio State having one fewer loss, even though they're not the Big Ten champion. And I don't, I just don't see. I don't see Wisconsin getting in over Ohio State with two losses, especially a loss to Illinois. I mean, this is a playoff committee that has, I don't know if you know this, Chip, but they have they have penalized bad losses in the past. Mm-hmm. They have, they've penalized specifically Big Ten teams with bad losses in the past. I'm talking about I'm talking about losses to teams like Iowa and Purdue, Chip. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I, I, let's not even let's not let it come to that. Let's let Chase Young be the wrecking ball on Saturday night, and uh, we'll come back talk about it next week. Get ready for the postseason beyond the championship game for the conference and bowl season. Looking forward to it. Yeah, maybe you and I can uh, go through the bowl games. Uh, game by game and uh, make some picks or something and then we can uh, keep score and then we can find out how bad we are at making picks. <laughs> it's an idea. All right. So uh, we'll do that next week. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, please, uh, you know, we are, we are blessed and fortunate to be part of a wonderful uh, group of shows on the Ozone Radio Network. So please give those your attention. The Buckeye Weekly, of course, uh, which uh, I mean... When do they not have a show? They have a show seemingly every day. Sometimes you have to be a Patreon uh, member to uh, to get some of those shows. But they have two to three shows every week where you get them absolutely free. So give uh, give Tony and Tom a listen. And uh, give the Buckeye Sloopcast guys a listen. They uh, they drop every Monday and Friday. So they, rec- they record Sunday nights and uh, Thursday nights. And uh, you can grab those. Uh, if you subscribe, you can grab them at midnight. They'll just uh, download to your phone or your your podcast catcher. And uh, please, uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to ours and uh, head over to iTunes. And uh, it would be really uh, great if you could leave us a a star rating and review and because that's how we get found by more people. So we appreciate everybody listening. Be back to do it again next week. And uh, it's go time, man. It's go time. It's postseason. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Can't All right. Wait. Let's sign off, then, the way we have uh, made it a habit of doing. Go Bucks! Go Bucks!